pancreatic cancer. Um, unfortunately, it's considered to be one of the most deadliest malignancies as of today. And then even by the year 2030, it's projected to become the second leading cause of cancer-related death in this country. One of the most important things is never lose hope, right? You never want to lose hope because despite um, the things we may hear or read about, many options still come up that you may have not been aware of. My name is Dr. Arsan Asapov. I work at Cedar sinai Medical Center. I'm a medical oncologist and a clinical translational investigator specifically focused on pancreatic cancers or pancreatic tumors. A majority of pancreatic cancers happen sporadically. In other words, something changes in the genetic code within the cells of the pancreas and that leads to the tumor. Now, certain things we do can increase your risk. Smoking is a major risk factor along with dietary habits. Eating processed foods, not eating healthy, being overweight and developing diabetes, that could also be a risk factor for developing pancreatic tumors. There are multiple genes that can lead to inherited syndromes which increase the risk of developing pancreatic cancer. One of the most common ones is the genes or gene involved in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Many people have heard about the BRCA gene or BRCA. This is one of the most common inherited cancer susceptibility genes. And should you have a BRCA2 mutation, the chance of developing pancreatic cancer goes upfold of three and a half to 10 times. Even though these are genes that are associated with breast and ovarian cancer, these are not only confined to women. There are men who can also have BRCA mutations in whether it, it, it pertains to pancreatic cancer or other tumor types. It's important to know that patients that have inherited mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2, which is the more common mutation that can occur in pancreatic cancer, they reflect the ability to repair DNA or DNA damage response. And if you have these mutations, we know that you, certain types of chemotherapy with agents such as platinums that actually further damage DNA, patients may have a response to them. And even newer drugs, which involve DNA damage response in the cell, such as PARP inhibitors, patients who have the defects in BRCA1 or BRCA2 may have a, a increased response to PARP inhibition. Germline or inherited BRCA mutations occur somewhere between 5 to 15% of patients that have familial pancreatic cancer. It's usually around 60 to 70 years of age when patients are diagnosed. It doesn't happen in, in, in children or people in their adolescent uh, years, but there are a, a cohort of patients that actually are diagnosed in their 30s and 40s. Oftentimes when you present with it, the symptoms are things that you may not make too much of. You may say, oh, I have an upset stomach. I've lost a little bit of weight. My bowel movements aren't the same. And that's why oftentimes patients are diagnosed when the tumor is more advanced. 85% to 90% of patients who are ultimately diagnosed with pancreatic cancer complain of weight loss. One of the main contributory factors to extreme weight loss in patients with pancreatic cancer can be related to pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. The pancreas is a gland which produces multiple digestive enzymes that help with the digestion and absorption of food. If you have a tumor that sits within the pancreas, this can compromise its ability to make these enzymes. This leads to maldigestion, difficulty in fat absorption, and then uh, what's also known as steatorrhea. One of the general uh, backbones of therapy is to treat these patients empirically with oral pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Oftentimes, besides the weight loss, there are other associated symptoms that should uh, suggest to someone that they have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. These other symptoms can include flatulence, abdominal cramping, bloating, uh, accompanied with the more common symptom of weight loss. One of the backbones of therapy is actually surgery for pancreatic tumors. However, most patients don't get diagnosed in a, in a way where surgery is the best option in the beginning. And despite even those patients that can have surgery, the tumor and about 80% of them ends up coming back at some point. The other part of the therapy is chemotherapy. And chemotherapy, you know, if you go as far as back into the, the 90s, it really was really one drug, gemcitabine. And over the last 
two decades, things have changed, things have improved, um, where now we use two drugs or multi-drug regimens, such as initially started with a regimen known as gemcitabine and napaclitaxel or Braxane. Um, and then more recently, we had a multi-drug regimen for advanced pancreatic cancers known as fulfirinox. And the hope of this is to not only improve symptoms, but survival for patients with pancreatic tumors. Over the last 45 years, despite all the treatments I mentioned, from single drug to dual drug to multi-drug regimens to surgery, and even with radiation being added into the mix, our five-year survival for this uh, tumor in the last 45 years has only improved marginally. Clinical trials, they represent the most promising option for patients moving forward and the most promising option for novel treatments. When you hear immunotherapy in cancers like lung cancer or melanoma, it has completely changed the field. However, we have found that immunotherapy by itself in pancreatic cancers doesn't work. Here at Cedars and across big academic centers, we have trials focused on how do we take immune therapy and how do we unlock its potential for pancreatic tumors. And one of the trials that we have here that we're focusing on is adding a drug on top of immunotherapy and chemotherapy to sensitize the tumor, to make sure that maybe immunotherapy where it doesn't work by itself, now we can unlock it. Pancreatic cancer represents probably the pinnacle of challenge in oncology. If we are to solve it, we'll have an unbelievable and truly life-changing impact for many patients um, across the globe.